the work that I'm going to present today is primarily that which uh, I accomplished when I was at UCSF for 28 years. Um, I want to acknowledge the residents that helped put this information together on hyperostosing uh, sphenoid wings. I don't really have any disclosure relevant to this uh, presentation, um, and none um, since I've joined Baptist Healthcare that are, are uh, that are relevant. So what I thought I would do would be to uh, first. Uh, for some of the more junior faculty talk about what I think are the anatomic boundaries for safe bone resection. I'm going to go over in detail with um, individual slides of intraoperative photographs of the anatom or of the operative techniques. And then I'm going to show you some uh, quantitative and qualitative as well as radiographic results from the analysis of 59 patients uh, treated um, at UCSF. Uh, so for this particular uh, clinical syndrome, which uh, Cushing pointed out is almost exclusively in women, um, you know, it, the indications for consideration of treatment for me were documented growth of the either the soft tissue or the bony component uh, of the tumor with progressive proptosis, associated visual loss, or an unremitting uh, pain syndrome. Uh, and I'll give you an example of such. So Here's a, a case example of a 39-year-old female uh, with right-sided proptosis more so than left, right temporal headache, um, interval follow-up imaging studies with an unremitting uh, uh, paraorbital headache syndrome, and the patient actually requested that we intervene. So here's the CT and the MR images. You can see the CT, the hyperostosis, not only on the right side, but this is the only case I've seen where the patient had bilateral hyperostosing sphenoid wing meningiomas. And typical for these cases, the volume of tumor-involved bone is always greater than the small soft tissue middle fossa component. If you ever see uh, a patient with an erosive sphenoid wing meningioma, and particularly if it's a male, um, you should start thinking about other diagnoses or an aggressive form of meningioma, such as atypical or malignant. So on this, uh, in this patient, the aim was to uh, try and give her some relief from her pain syndrome, improve the cosmetic result in proptosis. And here's the post-operative CT scan. Um, you can see that we have uh, reconstructed the lateral wall of the orbit, which I think is important. A lot of surgeons don't do that, but if you get an ophthalmos because of your orbital decompression, there's no way to fix the um, or get hypotopia, meaning downward displacement of the globe. There's no way to fix the double, double vision that results without doing a second operation with um, ophthalmology. And you can see the soft tissue component was removed from the middle cranial fossa. We left some soft tissue in the spiroorbital fissure. And I do all these operations with, in combination with uh, an oculoplastic surgeon who does the periorbital dissection uh, and even he was unable to remove the part towards the orbital apex and the muscle cone. Uh, here's a different uh, patient, 79-year-old woman, uh, older than the typical patient, but she had long-standing history of uh, decreasing vision and a bulging eye for years. You can see the Humphrey visual field uh, of the um, right eye in this case, where she has a, a compressive um, uh, neuropathic defect in the um, in the right eye from many years of long-standing orbital apex compression. Here's the CT scan, unilateral right-sided hyperostosis. You can see the associated proptosis here, which you can actually measure quite simply by drawing a line across here, a zygomatic uh, uh, process, and then just measuring the distance from that line to the front of the lens, and then a similar, and then take the ratio and uh, a number greater than one means proptosis, a number less than one means n ophthalmos if you're looking at it postoperatively. And here's the um, example of the, of the uh, bony involvement. Again, the intradural component uh, was small. Uh, this is this patient's postoperative scan. You can see the reconstruction of the region of the pterion. I simply use mesh in this region, a double layer of mesh, which I've reported on previously. And then again, orbital reconstruction with a MedPOR implant, which is uh, polymethylmethacrylate uh, and with an embedded titanium mesh, which allows us to uh, create the shape and maintain it. And again, you can see this patient has residual soft tissue tumor uh, in the orbital apex. And I'll comment uh, in the results section on the degree of bony 
and soft tissue removal on these patients. Now, I originally trained up in Canada in Vancouver and had the privilege of working with an outstanding uh, orbital surgeon, Dr. Jack Rootman. Uh, he wrote Surgery of the Orbit. He wrote Tumors of the Orbit, uh, had his own instrumentation. And we published a paper uh, way back in 1990 on 19 patients with optic nerve sheath meningiomas or hyperostosing sphenoid wing meningiomas in eight patients and uh, initially described the technique and the usual presentation, which you can see in this patient is typical for painless proptosis. It's a female uh, edema of the lower lid, which I presume relates to increased venous pressure within the orbit from the associated bony involvement uh, and then uh, involvement of the bone of the sphenoid wing and the, the intradural component is relatively small. Now, when I was doing these cases, I always thought about the no-fly zones, if you will, uh, of bone removal. Uh, there are some authors who currently advocate for uh, creating computer modeled examples or, or structures uh, if the tumor involves a superorbital margin or body of zygoma. I never removed the body of zygoma. The arch was removable if it was involved. And so the green bone is a bone that you can um, excise, do a craniectomy and replace. And the red bone is bone typically that I would not remove. And looking through the orbit, obviously the medial aspect of the orbit, the junction down here near the optic canal for the spear orbital fissure, obviously the floor of the orbit. If you go through this, you get into the maxillary sinus. And then looking um, on the intracranial side from above, here is the clinoid, here's the optic canal. You can remove the bone of the roof of the optic canal. You can remove the clinoid if it's involved. You can go down to the level, but not into the ethmoid sinuses. And I would not remove a uh, uh, tumor involved bone of the temporomandibular joint because excising that creates too much disability. I would not get involved with the eustachian tube. I would not get involved with the internal carotid artery. So the foramen ovale uh, was basically, and the foramen rotundum are the medial landmarks or for the extent of bony excision. And then looking from below, so you're looking up from the below the skull, here's the region of the spear orbital fissure. Uh, and these again are the um, landmarks that are primarily determined by cranial nerve foramina. Red being bone that we typically don't evolve, here's temporal mandibular joint, green being bone that we can um, excise. Uh, and just as a side note, this was a skull that was given to me by Dr. Charles Wilson when I was a fellow there in 88 to 90. And so I used this skull to paint with acrylic paint uh, to identify these or to outline these uh, regions for bony excision. Now the surgical technique I'm gonna go through, it's uh, for me, it was always a joint procedure between a neurosurgeon and an oculoplastic surgeon. There are advantages to the joint approach because of the pre-op assessment by the uh, oculoplastic surgeon, by the intraoperative assistance with the orbital reconstruction and removal of intraorbital tumor, and then the post-operative management, because a lot of these patients have mechanical disruption of, of ocular movement and double vision for a period of time, which eventually resolves. Uh, I would always use a coronal scalp incision rather than unilateral because it takes tension off the skin flap. The operations are generally long between six and eight hours. Uh, Two-part frontotemporal orbozygomatic craniotomy. I would remove the bone first, remove all the tumor-involved bone down to the optic canal, remove the bone above and below the spear orbital fissure. Above the inferior orbital fissure, you can take all that bone out. And then, uh, then we would open the dura, excise the intradural portion down to the lateral um, aspect of the spear orbital fissure and the meningo orbital band. Uh, and repair that with pericranium and then do the orbital uh, reconstruction with oculoplastics. And it's important after you do the reconstruction, I'll show you this, to do what is called a forced duction test. So the oculoplastic surgeon will take, will grab the tendons uh, of the eye extraocular muscles and move the eye through all primary uh, positions of vision to ensure that there's no entrapment of the muscle by the uh, implant. So, um, so the patient's usually draped in usual manner. We do a tarsorophy. We put uh, ophthalmic ointment into the eyes. The eyes are exposed for the procedure so that we can um, expose them and look at the position of the globe intraoperatively after the 
a reconstruction. This is what the patient looked like um, uh, before the operations. So the tumor is on the right side, which is the one we were operating on. Uh, typical coronal scalp incision, standard methods, which you all know. Uh, these green rainy clips have less closing force than the blue rainy clips. And because the operations are long, I preferred these. Uh, so there's less chance of, of scalp necrosis with uh, long operations. Standard approach, subgaleal, su loose areolar tissue reflected forward. Uh, preserve the pericranium along the spear temporal line over to the opposite spear temporal line so you can get a big pericranial graft. And then um, here's the temporalis muscle. And I frequently, I began to uh, avoid leaving a muscle cuff on the bone, but rather disinserting the muscle subperiosteally and then drilling chevron holes along the superior temporal line to later resuture the muscle. And that results in less uh, atrophy and less of a temporal hollow uh, in the post-operative period. Uh, he, in this case here, I was elevating um, the bone off tumor or the, the muscle off tumor involved bone with the electric cotter, but you can do it with soft tissue tumor, uh, soft tissue techniques. And here is the um, tumor involved bone that's exophytic here. We outlined uh, the planned site for the craniotomy and craniectomy. Um, you can drill down this involved bone first, and that allows you to create a template in order to mold uh, mesh. So you can see here, I've drilled down all the bone. And then I, before I did my two-part terional craniotomy, I actually molded the mesh to the shape of the drilled out reconstructed terion so that I would get a good cosmetic result. Um, you know how to do this. Here's the uh, bone removal down, exposing the roof and lateral wall of the orbit. Or the front zygomatic osteotomy is not being completed yet. Um, um, and previously, back in 1990, we discussed how we do this. And the advantage of removing the arch is that it gets the muscle out of the way so that you can remove any tumor involved bone along the floor of the middle cranial fossa down to rotundum and uh, ovale. Um, I use the foot plate attachment of the Midas Rex drill to do my uh, orbital osteotomy. I do not use um, the oscillating saw. Um, I usually remove uh, the bone um, uh, along the back edge, along the inner table side, and then secondarily remove the roof of the orbit. And if there's no uh, tumor involvement of the roof of the orbit, you can screw the two pieces of bone back together uh, for reimplantation. Um, this just shows the example of using the, you would put the foot plate under the arch uh, or the body of zygoma in order to um, do the osteotomy here. And I always thought that it was uh, uh, safer. Uh, and this is after the first part of the osteotomy has been completed. I've put absorbable collagen sponge over the exposed periorbital and orbital fat. And then this is the uh, tumor involved bone here that needs to be removed. And you can remove all the bone over the roof, lateral wall, the orbit, uh, down along the floor, the middle cranial fossa, in front of the temporomandibular joint, and the origin of the arch, uh, medially. And you do not need to reconstruct the floor of the middle cranial fossa. Uh, this is what the intraoperative um, uh, photograph looks like. You can see here that the bone is already quite thick. Uh, we have a, a retractor protecting the orbital contents in this case, and we go ahead and remove that with a drill. Uh, we use image guidance. You can see here intraoperatively that we can remove all the bone down to the um, junction of the uh, superior orbital fissure and inferior orbital fissure. You don't want to go deeper than that to get, and you end up in the, in the sphenoid sinus, um, which creates other problems for um, reconstruction. Uh, here's the optic canal. That's where right next to the optic nerve and internal carotid with that bone removal. Um, and that's seen on the axial CT scan uh, and these are the inline MR um, images. Um, so this is the what the intraoperative uh, picture looks like. Uh, Periorbita in this case has been resected. Uh, and this is the surgical specimen that was removed by the oculoplastic surgeon. Uh, and this was reconstructed with um, some uh, pericranium. And then we go ahead and open up the uh, convexity dura to excise the uh, soft tissue component, which is usually small. And you can take that excision of dura down to the lateral aspect of the orbital meningeal fold or superior orbital fissure, and you end up with this kind of a defect. Uh, and since you've done the coronal incision, you have a great pericranial flap that you can harvest free 
in order to do the reconstruction. So here's an example of the um, front zygomatic uh, osteotomy bone piece with the, the med pore titanium mesh. So you can see this is polymethylmethacrylate with embedded titanium mesh. And this allows us to maintain the shape. I use small four millimeter screws to um, secure the, the implant on the um, orbital side as opposed to the cranial side of the implant. But if there's no tumor involvement of the convexity bone, you can actually split uh, the front the uh, frontal bone here and uh, uh, harvest two triangular pieces of bone, which I'll show you an example of, and use those two inner table pieces to reconstruct the roof and lateral wall of the orbit um, instead of the polymethylmethacrylate. So here's the uh, osteotomy bone piece reimplanted. Here's the uh, small plate on the body of zygoma, a multi-hole plate on the arch of zygoma, a single dog bone plate on the medial aspect of the or orbital osteotomy. And then you can see the, the implant here. And this is the pericranial graft over the dura. And on the coronal CT scan post-op, you can see that we've reconstructed the roof of the orbit um, uh, quite well. And uh, the mesh implant over the region of the pterion uh, gives us a reasonable um, reconstructive um, um, and cos good cosmetic result. So here's an example where we actually harvested the inner table of the frontal bone to reconstruct the orbit. And this is what the reconstruction looks like for the uh, lateral wall and the roof. Uh, and this is it in situ. Now, one of the problems with that we've learned, we had two cases of uh, restricted strabismus because the posterior aspect of the medpor implant was tethering the lateral rectus muscle. We, we published this as a case report, uh, restrictive strabismus following this approach. This is uh, immediately post-op. You can see when the patient attempts to look to the left, her right eye, which was the operated side, is restricted. And uh, what we found on the uh, CT scan was that the uh, implant was impinging on the lateral rectus. And so we had to do a conjunctival incision. Uh, the orbital surgeon did that and was able to get down and release the muscle and uh, move the mesh out. So that's the reason why we do the force duction test. Uh, we'll do the orbital reconstruction, turn the skin flap back, open both the eyes, have a look at the globe position until we're satisfied. It usually takes a couple of maneuvers like that until you're happy with the orbital uh, reconstruction. And then once you're happy with it and the bone's back in place, then the ophthalmic surgeon will uh, do the force duction test to make sure that there will not be any problem with restrictive strabismus um, postoperatively. So that's a key step in the procedure, not one that a neurosurgeon should be doing. Um, now, when I reconstruct the area of the pterion, as I mentioned before, if there's an exophytic component in the region of the greater sphenoid wing or front temporal bone there, I will drill that down until I try and recreate the normal groove between the frontal bone, the temporal bone, and the sphenoid wing that we normally uh, identify in a, in a un, when there's no tumor bulb in a bone, and I actually use two layers of mesh, a thin mesh, because I can mold that, and then a secondary piece of mesh that's thicker on top, which is very difficult to mold. And then uh, presumably this provides some additional safety for the patient in terms of impact later on. This is what it looks like um, in situ with the um, mesh reconstruction of the pterion. I, I do not use hydroxyapatite or methyl methacrylate in this region initially. Uh, you could use a, a preoperative uh, implant that was created from um, computer um, imaging, but we haven't done that on a routine uh, basis. Uh, this is a standard kind of closure. One thing that's important to note um, is here's subperiosteal dissection. So there's oblique chevron holes that are that are placed into the bone above the superior temporal line. And this results in much less muscle atrophy and muscle sag than if you cut a cuff of muscle um, in order to release the temporalis muscle. Um, the other thing you'll notice is that you can see it here. I create little uh, recesses in the outer table of the skull so that when I put the... Um, the um, plates in, they're actually flush with the surrounding outer table of the skull. And then we use hydroxyapatite to fill in the gaps between the bone so that the galia in non-hair bearing scalp does not adhere to the scar that forms in the gap between surrounding normal bone and your craniotomy bone flap. And the, um, 
the plastic surgeons um, uh, taught me that trick. And um, uh, you can see that on, uh, I think I have a video on YouTube. It's called two-part parasagittal craniotomy. And it shows us putting the hydroxyapatite in and uh, using a bovie scratch pad and wet sanding it down to get a nice smooth uh, outer contour. Uh, so this is an example of a surgical result. I don't know if you would guess which side the tumor operation was on, uh, but the operation was on the right. There's a little tiny bit of temporalis muscle atrophy here. Globe position is perfect. Uh, no proptosis, no hypotopia. Uh, really good cosmetic result for this um, young patient. Um, and I think it's because, again, that we reconstruct the the tear in and reconstruct the orbital contents. And this is what the uh, preoperative uh, 3D CT looks like. And this is what the postoperative uh, uh, CT looks like after the uh, reconstruction, both externally and on, then internally as well. So if we look at the uh, results, you can see that in the, uh, for orbital reconstruction, the majority of the time we use this polyethylene MedPore implant a uh, quarter percent of the time we use the autologous bone uh, and rarely did we ever not reconstruct the orbit. So Bill Caldwell from Utah will routinely not reconstruct the orbit, uh, but my preference was to do so. So I'll, I'll show you the uh, publication, which is in the journal neurosurgery now on this uh, series of patients. Uh, it was a retrospective review. It was in the digital imaging era. So in 1999, we went to digital imaging as opposed to films. All the films prior to 1999 were destroyed, so we had no access, hence patients before 99 were excluded. Um, and then we looked at all these meningiomas that we did reconstruction on and calculated the uh, pre, early, and late postoperative exophthalmos um, uh, ratio, and I'll, I'll show you that. Demographics, as you'd predict, 83% were uh, female, uh, typically middle-aged, not older. 74% with proptosis, 41% with headaches, and 52% um, uh, had reduced visual acuity. And I think that's the other reason to involve your oculoplastic surgeons because they'll do the Humphrey visual field assessment to look for compressive optic neuropathy. Um, gross total resection in the minority of cases. The reality is only 30% of the time can you get all the tumor out? And as I showed you, usually it's a soft tissue tumor component towards the orbital apex. We're very good actually getting all the bone removed. And I'll show you the quantitative data from digitizing the CT scans pre and post-op. And the complication rate was not infrequent, and, but this includes medical and surgical complications. So Bill uh, Caldwell from Utah was the first to propose uh, a measurement called the proptosis index. Um, as a measure of outcome for these patients, you can see that over time, uh, the proptosis index declines. One is normal. Um, any, any ratio greater than one means that the eye is protruding. And he showed this example of a, a typical uh, patient uh, pre-op and then post-op. Uh, we did the same thing. As I mentioned, you can draw a line across between the anterior aspect of the frontozygomatic process and then just measure the distance to the front of the lens so in this case, the proptosis index would be 21.2 divided by 15.1, which is a number greater than 1.0. Uh, here are the results. The preoperative proptosis indices were 1.26. The early uh, postoperative, like six to eight weeks, was 1.13. And then greater than six months, uh, 1.08. So um, very good uh, reconstructions. And here's some visual examples. Here's the uh, proptotic eye. And then the submental view is actually very good for showing the degree of proptosis. So here it is pre-op, post-op, pre-op, post-op. That's perfect, that one. Uh, pre-op, minor, this one, post-op, perfect. Um, and what about the bony versus soft tissue extension? So the intraorbital component, we weren't very successful removing at all, only in about 26% of patients. The intradural component was actually easier, except when it involves a lot of wall of the cavernous sinus of the region of the optic canal. But look at the hyperostatic bone removal is very good. So 86% of the time we remove all the abnormal bone. And the problem is if you just remove the soft tissue component of these things and leave the bone, 
you're going to get a recurrence from the bone. It, either the bone will become hyperostatic or the bone will be denied us for the recurrence of soft tissue tumor. So you got to remove the tumor involved bone. Um, uh, about a quarter of the patients needed um, adjuvant treatment or 33% needed adjuvant treatment for imaging evidence of recurrence post-op. If I know I had a subtotal resection, um, then I usually recommend radiation therapy early rather than waiting for recurrence. Uh, and the recurrence rate in this series was uh, 25% with the median time to recurrence at about three years. Um, luckily, only 2% of patients had worsening vision as a result of this type of intervention. The majority were unchanged, uh, about 20% were improved. Um, double vision um, was unchanged in 76%, worse in 12, and there were a few patients that required reoperation. Uh, three for plastic surgical issues and four for orbital um, uh, problems, the two entrapments that I mentioned, and then some other, uh, other procedures. Uh, so this is a summary of ophthalmologic outcomes, the visual acuity, the pro proptosis index, um, afferent pupillary defects you could see improved. Um, obviously, the proptosis very improved. Uh, not much change in color vision because of nerve fiber loss and then the Humphrey uh, visual field results as well. Uh, normal vision, 20 over 20 uh, pre-op. Uh, there was only one patient who had impairment post-op. Um, there was three patients who had, were blind in that one eye, uh, ended up um, of those three, one had some very minor recovery, uh, but generally if they have no light perception pre-op or less than two, uh, 20 over 400, they're not gonna get better uh, even with the um, reoperation. Now, intraoperative complications, transection of the lateral rectus, uh, transection of the frontal nerve. This was both in the same patient. Uh, this was when I was using the Midas Rex drill to drill down the tumor involved bone in the region of the pterion. The resident moved, was trying to help me, moved his retractor. Uh, the shaft of the drill caught on a cottonoid, which pulled the string across the roof and lateral aspect of the orbit and cut everything in its path. Um, and so um, we simply um, brought in the microscope, reapproximated the superorbital nerve, superior rectus, levator, lateral rectus. Patient had complete, almost complete ptosis for uh, about 12 months, uh, but eventually recovered amazingly well. Um, and we uh, disclosed all of that intraoperative event to the patient and her husband, uh, which she recounted to the neuro-ophthalmologist post-op. So, uh, no issues there, full disclosure, you know, things happen. Just tell the family exactly what happened. Had a patient ultimately had a very good outcome. Um, uh, what, what other complications? Aborted surgery. This was a, an attempt where we were monitoring extraocular muscles, and we made an error by putting, uh, trying to uh, monitor the, the sphere rectus because the venous pressures were elevated in the orbit by the tumor and narrowing of the orbital apex. A uh, severe ophthalmic vein was engorged. The physiologist hit the severe ophthalmic vein, had an immediate intraorbital hematoma requiring emergency canthotomy for release um, in order to reduce the intraorbital pressure. The, the surgery was aborted. It was delayed by about eight weeks. Then we came back and, and did the operation. Transient neurologic deficits, I won't read them. You can see them here. Wound infection in four patients. One patient had tension pneumocephalus and one patient had a pseudomeningocele that resolve with um, uh, conservative measures. Here, re-ops in 26%. Uh, you can read the type of operations that we did. Uh, the wound washout were for the infections. And then here were the ophthalmic uh, procedures that were done, uh, two entrapment patients and others done for strabismus uh, or exotropia. Uh, my colleagues, uh, my neuro-ophthalmology colleague and oculoplastic surgeon, Dr. Reza Vegafi reported on the ophthalmic, ophthalmic results specifically uh, for the uh, orbital literature and uh, documented the improvements uh, in patients in terms of their proptosis index, uh, afferent pupillary uh, function, and uh, mean axis of deviation. Um, these are the surgical complications, same as I showed you before. So um, in summary, typical clinical presentation is a middle-aged female with painless proptosis unilateral, lower lid swelling, temporal fullness from uh, tumor-involved bone in the region of the terion, 
Uh, indications for treatment are documented growth of either the bony or soft tissue component, progressive proptosis, progressive visual loss, or an unremitting pain syndrome um, that usually actually operating actually helps. Um, and then I advocate a combined procedure between a neurosurgeon and an oculoplastic surgeon. Do the bone removal first, do the intradural tumor second, do the orbit last, reconstruct the orbit, and then make sure you do a forced duction test after the reconstruction to make sure there's no entrapment. I think our results show that they're um, really good. The cosmetic results are excellent. Uh, the majority of the time, 70% of the time, you're not going to get a gross total resection. So uh, beware of that. Look on fat suppressed post-contrast MR imaging for residual tumor in the orbital apex. And if it is there, uh, I advocate for early rather than delayed radiation uh, therapy. And um, the, remember that subtotal resection occurs in all compartments, the orbit, intradural, and the bone. And I recommend um, uh, using orbital reconstruction. And thanks to my colleagues at UCSF when I was there that uh, allowed me to do these cases. And uh, this was the view that I saw almost every day crossing the bridge for 28 years. Thanks for your attention. Thank you so much, sir. Um, thank you so much for this amazing, mm -hmm. really elaborate lecture on a very important neurosurgical condition that we do encounter. But um, uh, frankly speaking, not many neurosurgeons are that much well versed with the proper management of this very, very uh, important pathology, sir. Thank you so much for sharing so many important points. And I do think that this recording will be an asset uh, on the YouTube channel uh, for the a generation of neurosurgeons to come as a very uh, as an incredible referencer whoever wants to learn more about this the management of this type of tumor so thank you so much really for your incredible lecture sir i'm out of words to share how overwhelmed i am Sir, um, there is one question in the chat box uh, from dr mehmet sajur alwan from Aliana Training Hospital. So I guess you have already seen the question. He's asked that if the clinoid is affected in these surgeries, do you do an extradural clinectomy? Um, so the answer I put in the chat was yes, I do it extradural. Um, in order to do um, a safe clinoidectomy, you have to first unroof the optic canal so that you know where the proximal lateral portion of the canal is, that identifies the optic strut for you. Um, uh, you don't need to do a clinoidectomy to decompress the optic canal, right? So, but in order, if you want to do a clinoidectomy, the safest way to do it, I think, is to unroof the optic canal so you can identify the anatomic boundaries. And, it, and I, I always, even for clinoid meningiomas, if possible, I will do it extradurally. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, more questions and comments, kindly use the chat box to share more of your questions and we will be honored to share it with the Professor, yes, Professor McDermott. Um, sir, um, there is, uh, if, uh, I have one question myself, sir. Uh, sir, what's your view regarding the selection of endoscopic surgical procedures for hyperostoting meningiomas? Um, were you asking how do I remove the bone? Uh, sir, um, regarding the surgical technique, sir, endoscopic, yeah. endoscopic suprabital approaches. Oh. Yeah, no, I don't use any endoscopic techniques for these uh, tumors. No, it's all open. That's that's great, sir. Uh, sir, uh, Dr. Samuel Moskovici from Hede from Hedesi Sinkerem Israel uh, has asked about uh, elder radiation of a residual tumor. Yeah, so the, this is an ongoing debate, which is um, being studied in a prospective randomized trial currently in North America as to whether or not it's better to radiate early for residual documented tumor or wait until there's imaging or clinical evidence of uh, tumor progression before radiating. And our stance has been, actually, Bill Caldwell was uh, uh, actually didn't recommend radiation therapy, but he's changed his uh, viewpoint and he recommends early radiotherapy as well. There was historical literature from back in the uh, late 90s looking at the difference between uh, radiating upfront for benign residual disease versus waiting for recurrence. 
And the results uh, from UCSF suggested that it was better to radiate early rather than late. So that, that's been our practice. Um, and if you have residual disease and it's soft tissue or bone, I mean, the recurrence rate you saw in our series was 25%. Thank you so much, sir. Sir, there's another question from Dr. Beg Akail Bikov from Kyrgyzstan. He wants to know, he has first sent you a thanks a note. He said, thank you for your wonderful presentation. Can you kindly tell us about the rate of reoperation due to stabismus and another visual problem? Yes, so we had um, restrictive strabismus, as I mentioned, and entrapment in two patients. Uh, and there were other orbital procedures that were done. Uh, there were seven uh, ophthalmologic op reoperations. I, obviously, I didn't do them. Um, uh, two, three of those seven were for lid problems, two were for entrapment, and two were for strabismus. And sometimes these related to uh, uh, lateral rectus uh, or, or superior rectus uh, problems. Uh, more commonly, it was lateral rectus, so the ophthalmologist would do a uh, superior rectus um, and superior oblique transposition or muscle movement to help try and correct the strabismus or double vision. I, I wasn't involved in them, but the, the frequency of ophthalmologic reoperation was uh, 7 out of 58, 13%. Yes, sir. Sir, so there is a um, hi from Bolivia from, uh, from Dr. B uh, I guess. Oh, yeah, ultrasonic. Sir. Yeah, I have a, <laughs> yeah, the comment on using the ultrasonic uh, claw for removal of bone, it's fine except around cranial nerve foramina. Do not use the ultrasonic bone claw to unroof the optic canal because unfortunately you'll end up with a number of cases of post-operative blindness. So we still rely on mechanical bone removal with the diamond drill, lots of irrigation. If you're using the ultrasonic uh, system, the ultrasonic energy, which is conducted better through solid than air, that energy goes right into the optic nerve. And um, my vascular colleagues at UCSF stopped using that device uh, when operating on ophthalmic aneurysms because of several cases of unexpected blindness postoperatively. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, sir, uh, we, uh, I have got another question, sir. I just recently uh, came across a um, new study from the Chinese Medical Journal where they said that the 3D fusion images are very much helpful in um, assessing and predicting the extent of resection of um, uh, these tumors, sir. So uh, what is your kind view regarding such a scoring system that is based on 3D fusion imaging? Yeah, well, I'm an old dog, so I'm used to, um, you know, three-plane um, imaging as a 2D imaging as opposed to 3D. Uh, I guess if you're used to virtual reality and video games, you like 3D better, but um, I'm, I'm pretty good with determining uh, the extent of bone involvement on the axial um, CT scans. Um, uh, I'm sure that, you know, you could use the 3D to um, visualize that in a different way. Um, but my experience was primarily related to 2D axial and coronal CT imaging for bone involvement. Great, sir. Thank you so much for your wonderful talk and thank you so much for sparing your time for all this question and answer session. Sir, there is another question of mine, sir. Uh, again, sir, so, um, there is another one that I just came across uh, that uh, these hyperostotic meningiomas have an overexpression of the VEGF. Um, VEGF. So do you really think that uh, anti-VEGF um, agents such as a bevacizumab can be um, helpful in recurrent or residual tumors? Um, the answer is no. Um, you know, to date, most medical therapies have been unsuccessful. There have been isolated, um, you know, individual case reports of uh, recurrent meningiomas responding to poly-TK inhibitors. Uh, the anti-VEGF medications don't appear to work. Um, so we haven't used, we used them in San Francisco. We stopped using them. We used the anti-estrogen, anti-progesterone. We tried everything. Nothing worked. And it's particularly true for the bony involvement. Uh, radiation therapy, though, appears to stop 
uh, the growth of residual tumor or recurrent tumor. So we have not used uh, medical therapy because it's been unproven to date. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, thanks again for um, your very wonderful lecture as well as your time for the q and session. I would, like, uh, I would now like to invite Professor Hassan Kamil Soju to deliver the closing remarks. Sir, kindly. Thank you. Uh, also, uh, there is a greetings uh, from Bolivia. I need to read. Edilberto Flores G uh, says hi from Bolivian. Uh, okay, and I want to thank to Professor McDermott for accepting our offer to speak in Izmir Online Neurosurgery. It was an excellent lecture. Thank you so much, and I hope you see you each other again in uh, not the far future. Thank you. Okay, Aladdin, we can turn off the meeting. Bye. Bye.